Take your Bibles with me and open to the book of Ephesians chapter 1, if you would. The book of Ephesians chapter 1. Last Sunday, we began a new series of messages entitled, Experiencing the Trinity. And last week, what we kind of did was take a moment to try to understand and give you just a very simple way of understanding and being able to explain the Trinity. Uh, the, bio, the, the statistics tell us that, that evangelicals, by and large, say they believe in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And yet, in those same studies, we find that there is vast confusion over the actual doctrine of the Trinity. If they look and, and begin to examine it, what you really find is the majority of evangelical Christians actually believe something that is heretical about the Trinity. So last week I gave you three simple statements to kind of help you uh, sort it out. One of the mistakes that we make sometimes when we look at the Trinity is we try to draw a picture of it. And the reality is, is there is no picture, no human illustration that really can capture uh, what the Trinity is like. I hear people say, well, the Trinity is like an egg. Uh, the Trinity is like, you know, the relationship between a, a father and a son. The relationship is, is like this. The moment we do that, we're usually in trouble. None of those analogies actually work. In fact, they promote a misunderstanding of the, of the Trinity. So the best way to do it is just simply hold three basic truths in your mind. The Bible, number one, teaches us that there is one God. It is absolutely clear there is one God, one divine uh, entity in the, in the universe, God. But three persons in the Bible are referred to as God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We showed you that last week. If you, if you missed last week, go back. What's on the internet. Find our website and, and just check it out. And you can see all three persons referred to as divine. In other words, they share that divine essence. They des if you think about what it means, the divine essence, that's uh, the nature of God. Uh, if we think about his attributes, God is all-knowing, he's all-seeing, he's all-powerful, he is loving, he is kind, he is gracious. All of those descriptions of what God is like, all three members of the Trinity have all of those attributes. But they're all distinct. The best place to see that is the baptism of Jesus. There you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all present, all active in the baptism of Jesus. It's not uh, the idea that you have one God who sometimes acts like the Father, sometimes acts like the Son, sometimes acts like the Holy Spirit. No, you have three distinct persons in the Trinity. Now, the best way that I've found to kind of flesh that out and understand it is to see how the Trinity works. In fact, over the last almost two years, I have been studying this particular doctrine uh, and, and kind of trying to get an understanding of it. And in the reality, what I found is, is that the best way to understand the Trinity is to see how they are all working together to accomplish their will. In fact, I'm going to show you this morning, the best place to begin that is to understand it in our salvation. If you can see how all three persons of the Trinity are involved in your salvation, salvation, then when you open your Bible, all of a sudden you begin to see all three persons at work in creation. You begin to see that when you pray, all three persons of the Trinity are active in your prayer life. When you read your Bible, all three members of the Trinity are active in revealing God's will to you. So what happens is this is kind of the key that sort of unlocks it and you begin to see how they begin to work uh, together. And, and so what I want us to do is just open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, and, and this is one of the deepest passages in all of the scripture. I'll be very honest with you, we're only going to scratch the surface of this. If you look at verses 3 through verse 14, it's actually one sentence in the original language. Uh, in English, we break it up into multiple sentences to make it a little simpler, but this is perhaps the most profound sentence ever written, in my opinion. 
all right? It is absolutely profound. It tells us an incredible amount of, of what God has done for our lives and in our lives and how he has worked to accomplish our salvation. And we're only going to scratch the surface. There's a lot of things in this passage that, that maybe we would want to look at. But, but let me just kind of paint the picture for you and, and remind you what's happening. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter uh, to the Ephesians sometimes during that two-year period when he was in prison in Caesarea. So he's writing it from prison, and he's awaiting his transport to Rome where he's going to stand trial. Um, he's going to stand trial because he's been preaching the gospel. And so he writes to this church. Now, the church at Ephesus has the distinction of being the church that Paul spent the most amount of time in. Spent three years in this one single church, and he loved it a great deal. And this is a very strong, very vibrant, very powerful church. And so he is writing um, this letter to kind of remind them of the gospel. In many ways, you could say that the, uh, uh, his time in Ephesus was sort of the high watermark of Paul's ministry. Because what's going to happen is the gospel is going to really spread out all over the world right from this church in Ephesus. And so Paul's not really writing this letter to correct any problem. You know, most of the time when Paul writes you a letter, it means he has to take you to school on something. <laughs> you know, uh, So in Galatia, they got the gospel wrong, so Paul writes a letter to fix it up. The church in Corinth got almost everything wrong, so he writes a letter to fix them. When you get a letter from Paul in those days, generally, Paul is going to take you to school and say, you kind of messed up something. Here in Ephesians, it's interesting. Paul's not writing to correct any problem. Rather, he just wants to talk about the glory of the gospel. And he begins by thinking about how in the gospel... And in our salvation, the entire Godhead is at work. One of our mistakes is we make our salvation very man-centered. We focus on what we do. We focus on our response. And we understand that to a certain extent, right? Because uh, it feels like when we get saved, we did it all. But the reality is we didn't do anything. In reality, God is powerfully at work at the moment of our salvation, bringing about something that he has been planning and working for for all eternity. So what I want to show you this morning is how all three members of the Trinity work to accomplish your salvation. Let's begin reading. Let's read uh, uh, from verse 1 all the way down through verse 14, then we'll come back and break it down. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before for him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all thing, things according to the counsel of his will, so that he, we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, but, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now I want you to notice there that this entire passage is actually couched in the form of a praise. 
You notice the very first, uh, uh, one of the first words there in verse 3. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who has Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. The word blessing, when we think of blessing, we tend to think uh, uh, in terms of, you know, God giving us stuff, right? Uh, so we're blessed with good health. We're blessed with wealth. We're blessed with comfort. Um, if things are going well, we count ourselves as blessed, right? And that is partly true. God blesses uh, those that he loves, and he blesses us with all kinds of things, all right? But the word blessing here is really taken to an entirely different level. It shows us that the greatest blessings we have are not really physical. They're not material. The greatest blessings that we have as believers are actually spiritual. They're the result of God working in our lives. And so what Paul does is he builds this entire passage around the specific spiritual blessings made available to us by each member of the Trinity. And so the first thing that he mentions is our first spiritual blessing is that we have been chosen by the Father. This is an amazing verse, what he says there. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Look what he says. In the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. I, I want to point out three important aspects of God's choice. Number one, it was deliberate. Um, I used to have a librarian at our school when I was in high school, and uh, she was a hilarious older lady. She was one of these uh, older ladies that you just loved being around because she had a great sense of humor. She was funny. She understood kids. She wasn't kind of the, the, the maybe stereotypical, you know, mean old librarian you find... I actually have never found a mean old librarian. I love librarians. But, but, but this lady was, Mrs. Urban was wonderful. And she used to say to me every once in a while, she would say, you know, Buchanan, she called me Buchanan all the time. She said, you know, Buchanan, you can pick your friends and you can pick your nose, but you can't pick your relatives. All right? That's true, isn't it? Look around you. Would you have picked some of your relatives? Maybe not. Maybe so. I don't know. All right. But this is a deliberate choice on God's part. In verse 4, he's emphasizing that God made a deliberate free choice in saving us. He says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And then he reinforces that in verse 5 by reminding us that we've been predestined us for adoption. Now, people get all hung up on this. What does it mean that God predestined us? Well, predestined means he determined beforehand. Now, you could say, well, I don't like that passage, and I don't understand that. But if you say you under don't understand it, amen, because I don't either. That's a bigger concept than I, my little mind can get around. But the Bible says it. It says that before the beginning, God chose us before the foundation of the world. Stop and think about that for a moment. That makes our salvation incredibly glorious. Before God created anything in the universe, before he spoke the heavens and the earth into existence, before he spoke one molecule of this physical universe, he decided that he would send his son to redeem you. You, you know, I, I love that old song that says, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. But I got news for you. The doctrine of salvation starts way before the cross. It starts not even at the moment God created, but before he created, God had already, the Father, had made a sovereign, deliberate choice that he was going to save us. Number two. Not only was his choice deliberate, but it was purposeful. In other words, God wasn't just making an arbitrary choice. God had a purpose and a reason. Notice there in verse 4, he says, number one, that this purpose was to deal with our sin problem. He says that we should be holy and blameless before him. I have people every once in a while come by my office and they say, Pastor, what is God's will for my life? And I know what they mean by that most of the time. They mean, what does God want me to do? 
Well, well, let me take that and back that scope out a little bit and just kind of zoom back a little bit. God's ultimate purpose for your life is for you to be holy and blameless, to be set apart and completely free from sin so that you can stand before him because God desires a relationship with us. That's emphasized in verse number five. Did you notice what he says there? He has adopted us at, for, a, he says, in love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. I have a good friend named Eric. And uh, well, we prayed for Eric for a long time. Uh, he was waiting for a liver transplant and finally got it and he's doing well. And, um, but Eric, ever since I've known him, has been aware that he was adopted. His parents adopted him when he was just a baby. And for many, many years, uh, he wondered who his original birth parents were and eventually got to meet them and, and ha has a relationship with them now. But I remember Eric said something to me many years ago. Eric was, uh, and I were, lived across the street from each other, so we were always fussing at each other. You know, we were best friends for 10 minutes, and, and then uh, I'll never forget, the biggest fight I think Eric and I ever had was over. He had a little yellow Tonka truck that he wouldn't let me play with. Brought it to my house and then wouldn't let me play with it. I got mad and I called him a name and he called me a name. And, and then finally he ended this with this. He said, oh yeah? He said, well my parents, they weren't stuck with me like yours were. They chose me. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. I've lived with that insult for 40 years now and I still haven't figured out a good comeback for it. All right, the reality is, is he was right. God is not stuck with us. We were not naturally born as his children, but rather we have been adopted by his deliberate, purposeful choice into his family. His election was to deal with our sin problem and to restore us into a relationship. That's why we can call him father. This is a concept, by the way, that takes on a bigger emphasis in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there are occasional times when the Israelites would refer to God as Father, but it's pretty rare. They don't do it very often. And they felt that might be a little bit irreverent. They also didn't have the full picture of salvation. But in the New Testament, Jesus teaches us that you and I can come before God now and pray because he's our father. That's why we start our prayers, our father. Why? It's, it's a reminder that we have a deep, personal, intimate relationship. The final thing we notice about this choice is that not only was it deliberate and purposeful, but it had a motivation. It was motivated by love. Did you notice what he said in, at the end there of verse 4 and the beginning of verse 5? In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. It is reminding us that you have been loved by God even before he made you. Even before he created this universe, he loved you. In love, he predestined us for adoptions as sons. I was reading an article here not too long ago, and it was talking about people's greatest needs. It was asking young people, what's the thing that you need to know more than anything else? And the number one thing that young people said they wanted to know was that they are loved. As a parent, the most important thing that your child knows is that you love them, right? Not just that you're in charge or you're in control, but that you love them, that you unconditionally love them. I, I, I remember uh, one time when, uh, when uh, Matt was real young, we uh, had gone down to his soccer practice. You'll not believe this, but they let me uh, be his soccer coach. I was an assistant soccer coach, which in my estimation amounted to this. I stood on a sideline and yelled, kick the ball. Kick the ball! Kick the ball! Kick the ball! Now, I also had a son 
that once played goalie, once. Because then I had to add another thing to my repertoire because Matt sat down and was picking grass in the goal. I had to yell, kick the ball, Matt stand up, kick the ball, Matt stand up. Y'all following me? Anyways, that's a silly aside. We walked home from, got home from practice one night and we walked up to our back door and my back door was open. And I started, said, Matt, stop. I was sitting there thinking, could I have left that back door open? And I wasn't sure. And I didn't know what to do. And I stopped there for a minute. I said, Matt, stand here right beside the car. I'm going to go in and check the doors. I'm going to see if somebody's in there. Now, I'm an old hillbilly. I'm a West Virginian. I protect my home place. I assume if you're in my home and I didn't invite you in there, we are about to go to battle. All right? So I, I puff up. You know what I mean? I get ready. I'm, I'm walking in there. I'm going to find whoever's in there. I'm going to whip the tar out of them. Was we were wa- actually, <laughs> I was shit. That, I'm lying to you. <laughs> I was scared to death, all right? But I didn't want anybody to know that, so I walked in there as bravely as I could, and I felt something. Matt had a hold of the back of my pants, and he was right behind me. You know what he knew? He knew the safest place for him at that moment was as close to his daddy as it could get. I'm going to say this to you. The safest place in this world for you is as close to your heavenly father as you can get. Some of you walk in here this morning scared, afraid. You got battles, you got troubles, you got all kinds of stuff going on in your life. You have a God that's your father who loves you and he's loved you before he even created the world and he created the world and he created the universe just for the sake of loving you and I don't understand that I don't understand why he needed wanted to do that but he did before he even created the world God the Father chose us but then he says the second thing I mentioned to you that he was going to deal with our sin the second act of the trinity we see in our salvation is God the Father chose us but God the Son redeemed us. Look in verse 7 of what he says here. He said in him, now he's talking about Jesus, in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. You notice here that he mentions there is a twofold work of the Son. First of all, Jesus died on the cross to redeem us. The word redeem uh, comes right out of the slave trade. It is a word that means to purchase the freedom of someone who has been held in captivity. From the moment of our birth, because of the sin of our first parents, Adam and Eve, you and I are born with an irreparable problem. And I mean irreparable in our own effort, in our own strength. We can't fix our problem. We are born, the Bible says, in sin. Romans 3.23 says we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The, the, The incredible truth is, is this. You know what, all the problems in the world are, they all boil down to this problem. We are sinners both by nature and by choice. And until we deal with that problem, we can't fix anything else. You look at your life and you say, what am I going to do to fix my life? You can go through all the self-help, all of the therapy that you want, but I'm going to tell you, the most important remedy is the gospel. You need to deal with the core problem in your life, which is you're born by nature a sinner and by choice have rebelled against God. That's the truth. 
And, and so what he says here is Jesus came to redeem us. We have been born under the captivity of sin. In fact, as soon as we're old enough, we will make that choice to sin consciously. But there's good news. Jesus came to do for us what we could never do on ourselves. People ask me every once in a while, um, how do I deal with the Old Testament? Well, see, the Old Testament, you have to understand its purpose. The Old Testament is to point us to Jesus. It is just as much valid and equally important as the New Testament. <laughs> By the way, I don't care what any popular preacher in old culture today says. The Old Testament is absolutely essential. All right? you got to know, the Old Testament tells you, here's what your problem is. Here are some simple rules. God starts out by giving Adam and Eve one rule, and they fail. They can't keep it. He gives us ten rules, and, and we can't keep those. And here's the point. A lot of people say, well, the Old Testament is important because uh, there's a new means of salvation. The Old Testament was never given to save anyone. It was given to show that you need saving. It was given to show you that you've sinned. In all reality, the Ten Commandments show us what our problem is. It's the diagnosis. When you go to the doctor and he says, here's what your problem is. You have this or you have that. In the Old Testament, God says, look, your problem is sin, but I've got a remedy. And in the Old Testament, he begins to picture that remedy through a series of, uh, of uh, sacrifices and, and types and pictures. But the fulfillment comes in Jesus. God sent his son to do for you what you can never do for yourself. He came to redeem you. He came to take you out of the slavery of sin and give you salvation. And you'll notice Paul uses a number of phrases here to kind of expand on this idea and explain it. First of all, he talks to us about the means of our salvation, the means of our redemption. He says we've been redeemed through his blood. When Jesus died on the cross... He shed his blood in our place. He became our substitute. He took my place and he took your place so that we could go free. And then he emphasizes the results. He reminds us that we've been uh, received the forgiveness of our trespasses. The word forgiveness there is really important. Because it comes from a root word that means to let go. I don't know about you, but sometimes I struggle with forgiveness. Because I want to hold on to it. I like to keep things that people have done to me in my pocket. So that when I'm mad at them, I can bring them around and slap them with it. You understand what I mean? But the Bible says when God forgives us, listen to this. He sets our sin as far as the east is from the west. And he remembers it no more. That means that in God's eyes, when Jesus died on the cross and you received him as Lord and Savior, he doesn't even remember your sin. It's gone. It has been wiped clean, paid for completely by the blood of Christ. Then he talks to the extent. I love what he says here. Uh, look down here with me uh, in, in, in verse number seven. He says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Listen to what he says. Which he lavished upon us. God said, Paul says, God's grace, his love, his redemption, what he does in your life, in his mercy and his grace, it is extravagant love. It is, he lavishes it on us. Uh, when we lived in Richmond, Virginia, uh, I discovered uh, Fat Man's Paradise. I can't remember the name of the restaurant right now, but a, there was a family in our church that had adopted a couple of children from Brazil. And they had found a Brazilian restaurant uh, in the city of Richmond, Virginia. And they took my wife and kids and I out there one day to eat. And this is the most amazing place that I've ever seen in my life. I'll just be honest. So here's what they do. For lunch, they make uh, about six or seven different kinds of meat. And they put it on a skewer and they put it over a fire and they cook it. For dinner, they have 12 of them. All right? I couldn't handle dinner. 
If they, so here's what they do. They bring this skewer by your, your, your table and they put it on your plate and they just cut this meat off. And you have a little card. There's a red side and a green side. If the green side is up, they keep, Adam, listen to this, they keep bringing you meat. Do you understand what I'm saying? They don't stop bringing you meat. They don't bring you a plate. And they don't even come by and say, would you like some more meat? Card green, meat on, buddy. They start cutting that meat. They put a little beef on there. They put a little chicken on there. They'll put some ribs on there. They'll put, I don't know what all they put. They put chinchilla on there for all I know. I don't know what all they put. Well, here's what I found. It was all delicious, and I kept eating it. All right? Um, I ate it till I turned green. All right? Um, they lavish it upon you. Do you all get what I'm saying? I, it, lavish means abundant. It's not that God's giving you just enough grace so that you get by on the skin of your teeth. He is lavishing his love and his mercy and his grace upon you. And then he says there's a purpose for it. The purpose is to make known the mystery of his will, which is to unite all things in him. You see... We live in a disordered universe. Have y'all figured that out? We live in a, physicists tell us, scientists tell us that. We live in a disordered universe. The whole universe is falling into disorder. But God says there's a plan. He is going to reconcile and bring all things together in him. Romans kind of emphasizes this, the fact that our salvation even affects the created order of the universe. It even affects the creation. And he's reminding us here that God has this incredible plan and purpose to make known the mystery of his will. I believe that one of these days in heaven, the angels of heaven are going to gaze in amazement at our salvation and what God has done. So look what happens. God, the Father, chooses us. God, the Son, redeems us. But God, the Holy Spirit, has a role in this. Notice what he says in verse number 11. He said, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we were the first to hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory. Look what he says in verse 13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. By the way, I skipped over some stuff, but we'll come back to that later on. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. The word seal here is a mark of ownership. In those days, um, what they would do is they would take, if they made a contract, they'd fold the contract up, put a little wax on it, you had a signet ring with an impression on an imprint on it. You would push that imprint onto that document and it indicated that that was from you. It was the way to authenticate that what you were looking at was an official sealed document. Um, in, in our days, we might think of the terms in branding. Uh, back in the old days, you know, somebody would brand their cattle or brand their horse to, to mark the ownership. Well, here's what happened. Today, uh, we, today we use that word brand to describe a logo. How do you know, you know what computer you use? Because it has you know, an Apple logo or it has a Microsoft logo or some other logo. What kind of shoe you wear? I remember when I was a kid, uh, that was back at the beginning of, tennis shoes being cool. Prior to that, people just wore tennis shoes to cover their feet. <laughs> and I, I've never been hip, all right? I'll never be accused. I'm never in fashion. This is as fashionable as I get, all right? This is my new spring wardrobe, all right? I'm not, I don't, I don't get into that. I don't care about brands at all. But I remember when I was a kid and we played basketball. Uh, most of our dads would take us down. There was an auto body, uh, a supply place down in Steubenville, Ohio called Kittings. And Kittings sold uh, shoes. They sold the shoes that had, like they were like the, uh, the rejects. They had a blemish on them. You all know what I mean? They had a blemish. They'd have a, a spot on them. They'd have the name spelled backwards, uh, uh, something like that, all right? And, and we'd go down there, and, and my dad would get me tennis shoes from down there. Not that we were poor. Dad just understood they were only tennis shoes. 
You're going to wear them for six months. Why spend a whole lot? Of, why spend, you know, back then 30, 40, 50 bucks for a pair of tennis shoes? Well, I'll tell you what, man, I wore my, now these are cool today. I wore my Converse Chuck Taylors with a big red spot and with Converse misspelled. <laughs> All right. But Tim Delaney came out in a brand new pair of, I don't know what they were, Nikes, something like that. Brands mean a lot, right? Brand marks ownership. The Holy Spirit marks God's ownership of your life. The moment you are saved, and I will show you that in a moment, God marks us as belonging to him. The evidence that we are truly converted is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We've made this mistake as Southern Baptists, and I want to warn you about this. We, we've asked people the wrong question sometimes. When we talk about assurance of salvation, we like to ask them about what they have done. Did you walk an aisle? Did you pray a prayer? Did you do this? That's really not the right question. The question is, do you see the work of the Holy Spirit changing and transforming your life? That's how you know you're saved. If you don't believe me, go back and read the first, the, uh, uh, first John. There he gives us evidences. One of those evidences is that our lives are changing. We are becoming more and more like Jesus. The moment you're saved, the moment that you have come to know Christ, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, comes into your life and he continues that work of conversion by enabling us to continue to trust Christ throughout the course of our life. He teaches us, he guides us, he directs us to carry out the will of God. He sanctifies us, he changes our lives. He changes our mind. He helps us to understand the things of God. When we pick up our Bible, as you're going to see here in a couple of weeks, the Holy Spirit is active in that. He comes and he begins to help you to illuminate the Scripture. Have you ever noticed that? Before you got saved, you would pick up the Bible and it didn't make any sense to you. But all of a sudden, you pick up the Bible after you're saved and things begin to make sense. And that continues. Even to this day, I'll read a passage of Scripture that I've read dozens and dozens of other times. But now, some, the Holy Spirit will just point out a word or a phrase or something different. That is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in your life. He marks us as belonging to God and he guarantees our inheritance. Isn't that good news? We have a guarantee. The way we talk about this in baptism, we call this the perseverance of the saints. It means once a church person has been truly born again, God holds them and preserves them until the day of uh, that he comes back, till the day of their death or till the time that he comes back. He guarantees our inheritance. That's so important. Because our salvation doesn't depend on our ability to hold on. Because sometimes life will throw us some bumps and some curves. And there'll be some moments where we're not all that faithful. Where our hands slip on the rope. First or second year that I was here as your pastor, Cliff did a uh, family, some kind of retreat down at Kentucky Lake. And um, my family went down and spent some time, and I went down the last day, and Jeff Lang tried to kill me. They said, we're going to take some of the kids out and go tubing. Now I ask you, church, do I look like a guy who tubes? What kind of boat do you have to have to tube with me? I am a tube, all right? You understand? Jeff says, Pastor, why don't you get out there on the tube? Okay. So Jeff, being the loving, kind deacon that he is, pulls the thing up. I jump onto the giant tube with my son, Matt. We grab a hold of the ropes. And Jeff says, I'll take you around kind of slow. I swear, I think I heard him go, 
he jammed that thing on. I don't know what kind of boat it was, but he pulled me around that lake. He crossed every wake he could. He threw us up in the air. He, I'm telling you what, he about, finally I flew off. I'm only going to tell you the rest of the story, but it involves swimming trunks. <laughs> Here's the thing. That event kind of reminds me of life. You jump onto the tube, and at first it's a pretty nice ride. We were riding out through the, through the little, I don't know where we were at, maybe down at Big Bear or somewhere. There. We're pulling out through the little, you know, park, no wake zone. I'm riding. I'm like, this is great. Kind of like it's a small world. This is awesome. This is wonderful. Then you hit the main lake. And life turns up the motor a little bit. You start going a little faster. And then there's some turbulence that comes from other boats around you. That's kind of like the turbulence that happens in our life. Have you ever been thrown off course because someone, someone else did throw you off course? Life has a way of throwing some waves at you and some turbulence and some difficulty. And, and just to be honest with you, if it was left up to us to hold on to our salvation, none of us would make it. None of us would make it. We would all fail. We would do what happened to me. Uh, eventually, the rope slipped through my hand that I flew off and into the water. Thank God in our salvation. God does not leave it up to us to hold on, but he guarantees our inheritance. He guarantees that he is going to preserve us and keep us till the day of salvation. But I want you to notice that this work begins with a key moment in your life. Did you notice what he says there? He says in verse 13, in him you also, listen to what he says, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him. He says, what's going to bring about the sealing of the Holy Spirit? What is going to, to, to make this moment active in your life? It's that moment when you hear the word of the gospel. And I don't mean just with your ears, church. It's not just hearing the words. You're probably like me and you heard the gospel dozens, maybe hundreds, some of you, thousands of times with your ears. But one day, you heard it in the depths of your heart. God spoke to you. And you recognized that you were a sinner. You recognized that Jesus died on the cross for you. And you recognized that your only hope, your only means of salvation is him. And you believed. That word believe is a beautiful word. It really means to trust. You know, it's Mother's Day. And some of you have had very wonderful, loving mothers. Some of you haven't. I was very blessed to have a very loving mother. I trust my mom. My mom will tell me things that maybe no one else could tell me. Most of the time she tells me I'm great, and that's why I love her. She's going to listen to this sermon next week on, on video, and she's going to call me and say, that was wonderful. She's heard my best sermon. She's heard my word. But she'll also tell me how life really is. She'll, she'll tell me. She'll remind me. But she always loves me. I trust her with my life. I trust my life with my wife. Trust means Trust. When you sat down, you trusted those pews. He means, I trust that Jesus died on the cross and his death alone was sufficient for my salvation. Trust is really, I have my, my good friend Larry Garrison used to say it this way. He'd say the difference between heaven and hell 
is about eight or nine inches. What he meant was this. It's the distance between your head and your heart. So I can believe something up here. I can walk in and I can look at that chair and I can say, you know what, I think that chair would hold me. Looks, and maybe I could even do the math if I was a much smarter person. If I was Sonny Summers and I could do math or Carl Stewart and I was really a genius and I could, I, I, let, me, let me retract that. I just maybe inferred that Carl Stewart was a genius. He knows math, let's put it that way. And I could sit there and say, math, oh, I think that thing could hold me. And I could know it up here, but I don't trust it till I sit down. And listen to me, church. There are a lot of you here this morning, a lot of you hearing me by television, that believed it up here, but you've never rested. And that's the difference that Larry was talking about. That's the difference between heaven and hell. Have you trusted him completely? He says at that moment, the Holy Spirit comes in and he indwells you. All three members of the Trinity working together to accomplish your salvation. This morning, I ask you, have you given your heart and your life to Jesus? Do you know that you know that you know that when you die that you'll spend eternity with him in heaven? God invites you in a relationship with him today. And I'm going to show you it, it, that salvation is just the start. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit continue to work in every other aspect of your life to reveal themselves and accomplish their purpose. And if you think life is exciting before you're saved, man, wait till you, wait till you come to know him and you really have purpose. Some of you are sitting here today and say, that's what I need. Come this morning and receive it. Would you stand with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. Father, I can't even begin to scratch the surface of that passage. But Father, I pray today that your spirit would come and speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray you'd speak to those, number one, that do not know you. Lord, today that you might make the gospel clear to them. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to those who know you, but maybe have drifted away and have come here this morning looking and searching, maybe even just came here out of obligation. Maybe can't even tell you why they came. But Father, they're here and you've spoken to them. And I pray that your will would be done. I pray that you deal with their hearts however you want. Lord, maybe there are some here today that have come to know you but have never really dug deep into that relationship. Father, this morning I pray that you'd help them to see how all three of the persons of the Trinity, all three of you are working in their lives to bring about this incredible, glorious salvation. Father, guide us and lead us in this time of invitation. In Jesus' name we pray.